If you've done any reading or research into inquiry methods, you've probably already realized that there's a lot of different definitions out there, and that is one of the challenges with inquiry is finding common language to all use the same terminology. So I want to go through a few models of inquiry with you. Probably the most common one that appears in the literature is the 5E or the 7E model. But if you're already familiar with inquiry methods, um, as we're going through these different definitions of inquiry, think about ways that you can look at this from two lenses. One, how can these me methods increase student understanding of science and chemistry? And also, how might it improve student motivation? So we're going to be looking for two things. One, how to improve content knowledge, and also how to increase student motivation. So the most common one in the literature is the 5E model, and it is, unsurprisingly, five words that start with E. But the reason for the 5E model was to come up with a way of giving a sequence of events to occur if you're going to include inquiry methods. So the first E in the 5E model is to engage the learner. So we're looking at ways to introduce a phenomena to students that will get them excited, wanting to investigate, or posing an interesting question in front of them. Um, also in that engagement step, usually there is a somewhat of an assessment of prior knowledge so you know where your students are before you try taking them somewhere else. But after you've gotten them engaged in a task and they're ready to actually answer some questions, then it's time for them to actually explore what's going on. So the next E in the series is the exploration phase. And this could be done with analysis of data. This could be done with experimental design. This could be done with a demonstration, where students get a chance to dig into the phenomena and try to find more information about it. Then, after they had a chance to be engaged in the activity and explore the relationship between a few variables, the next thing comes is the explanation step. So that explanation can take varying qualities. Uh, it can be done through teacher-student interactions. It can be done just through students explaining things to themselves or seeking additional research. But this is where you take the, the concepts that they've seen in the laboratory or seen in a demonstration and start to wrap some concepts around it and giving students understanding that will allow them to explain what was going on. But it doesn't stop at the explanation step. After students have explained one concept, they should be able to go deeper into it. So after explanation, we're going to go into elaborating and looking at what the students know and how much they can pull that information forward and use that to go even deeper into the concepts to either give new examples or start to go further into the learning of whatever concept that you're trying to teach with whatever inquiry experiment you're doing. But after the elaboration step is the time for evaluation. So after we look at what students have learned, we need some kind of an assessment. How do we know how well you learn it? How confident are you in your results? What sort of evaluation are you going to use to understand if students got the information that they needed or didn't? And this doesn't have to be formal. It's not always tests and quizzes. It can be through questioning of students. It can be through informal assessment methods as well. So there's been an update to the 5E model that they added two more E's to it. So it's called, not surprisingly, the 7E model. But in the 7E model, they took the engage step, and they actually broke it into two pieces. Um, the first is to actually elicit what students already know, so assessing the prior knowledge that your students have through just informal questioning or whatever method you want to do to get the knowledge that the students already have so you're not wasting time covering what they already know, but you also know where you might have to fill in more information. And then that elicit step comes with the engagement, uh, and so you're still going to do something, some phenomena observation or something to get students interested in the activity that they're going to do. And then at the end of the, the E cycle, in the 7E model, they added one more step of extension. And uh, this is probably one of the bigger issues that we have in science classrooms. Getting students to be able to take knowledge that they learned in the classroom and transfer it into new methods of understanding or be able to apply it to new situations. I think this is something that we assume students can do automatically and is really not very automatic for them. Um, there's two types of transfers that are involved. There's near transfer and distant transfer. So near transfer would be something like you took an experiment that involved magnesium and hydrochloric acid and you ask your students what might happen with zinc and hydrochloric acid. The system is very similar and it's just a very small substitution. Students are usually pretty okay with that and these are the types of things that we ask them to do on tests and quizzes all the time. Uh, 
But when it comes to more distant transfers, that's where it can be actually much more challenging for students. So working the extension part into the laboratory cycle or into whatever concept you're going to teach your students is really pretty important for them to realize that this is not just something that happened once in class, that this happens over and over and over again in nature. One thing that the authors of the 7E model also did is they actually looked at evaluation and said, evaluation doesn't just happen at the end. Your evaluation cycle is sort of throughout. And so they actually pulled off evaluation all the way to the side and so that at every single step of the learning cycle, you're going to evaluate what your students know. So that comes in the assessing of prior knowledge. You're evaluating what did they already learn and what do I need to fill in. When students are designing a procedure, you're giving them feedback and evaluating at how well they're going through the steps. When we're giving explanations, we're evaluating there by the types of questioning we ask. So when you're going through the cycle, be aware that your informal assessment, your formative assessments, those things are going to be evaluating student knowledge all the time. So with this basic setup of the 7E and the 5E model, we're going to look at a couple of experiments and how you can implement this in the next segment. So to start the inquiry experiment, the first thing that I do is to demonstrate the system to the students. So uh, we have a couple of students here today. And so I'm going to demonstrate to you guys the procedure. So I've got 100 milliliters of distilled water here. And then to that, I'm just going to add one drop of food coloring. And then to the system, um, I'm going to actually add 10 milliliters of bleach. All right, so when I add the bleach to the food coloring, and I'll give it a quick stir, what do you guys notice happening? Changing color. All right, what color did it change to? Green to blue. OK. Uh, and are you guys noticing anything else? I think it's changing more. Um, so changing more how? It's getting like clearer. All right. The um, color's fading. So the color is getting less noticeable over time? Yeah. OK. So if we've got something that's already colored, and we're noticing the color is changing. What data do you think we can collect on the system? What sort of things could you measure? Uh, you could measure how much light is being absorbed. OK. Um, anything else? Light being transmitted through it. OK. Anything else you could measure? The amount of time it takes okay, to so, go from color to clear. Um, why do you say time? What have you been noticing that we've been doing here? A reaction. OK. Uh, so you saw a color change, and we see the color is over time. It seems to be getting yeah. less, less apparent. OK. Yes. So we'll look at lead absorbed. Um, we're going to look at time. Uh, and so if we're going to look at this, um, we know something about reaction rates. You guys had intro chemistry with me, right? And so um, when we talked about reaction rates, what sort of things did you guys notice affect reaction rate? How do you think we could modify this reaction? What could you do to Maybe this? Maybe change the concentration of how much bleach you put into the solution. OK, the so we could change um, how much bleach. Now, uh, we used 10 milliliters the first time, right? So what could we do the second time? Maybe 15 milliliters. OK, so we get up to 15 milliliters. Uh, any groups want to try 5 milliliters? See what happens if we go you know, in half? So we'll have one group that'll do 5 milliliters, one can do 15. Uh, we can probably have one group double, because if we do double the concentration, we can see you know, if it goes up by 2 or, or something like that. So we'll have one group that does 20 milliliters, one group will do 15, one group will do 5. Um, what else, other than concentration of the bleach, could we do? Um, possibly the amount of water you use. All right, the amount of water. So we could change. Um, water concentration, so we could both increase and decrease the amount of water that's in the system. OK. Uh, maybe you could change the temperature of the solution. All right. uh, temperature, so um, higher or lower? You could maybe do both. You could do higher for one, see if it goes faster, maybe lower temperature, see if it goes slower. OK, so we'll have one group do a high temperature trial and one do low. Um, so we're about room temperature now. So we're probably, I don't know, I'll pull out a thermometer, but I think we're probably around 22 degrees Celsius. So we could have one group go up by 10. Uh, and they could go to 32 degrees Celsius, and we'll have one group go down by 10, and they could go to like 12 degrees Celsius. So I'll pull out a hot plate and, and a nice bath for that. Um, anything else you guys can think we could vary? I 
All right. Uh, how much green food coloring did we use the first time? Just one drop. Yeah. Okay. Do you think we could change that? A couple put, more. Yeah. yeah. Zero drops. <laughs> No. Well, <laughs> <not anything. laughs> All right. So uh, we could try two drops of food coloring instead of one. Uh, we could actually try one group if they want to do three drops. All right. So we've got a lot of variation here. Um, if we're going to collect data on this, you guys said about light and transmittance. What, um, what instrumentation can we use to measure light changes over time or the transmittance or absorbance over time? The uh, spectrophotometer. All right, so the spectrophotometer, we used that earlier this year, right? So we had that lab first semester that we talked about. Um, and so you guys know, when I do this experiment in my class, they've already done a spectrophotometer lab. They've learned how to pick the analytical, analytical wavelength for a system. So they actually already know this stuff before we come to this. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit later about building the right skill set to make inquiry manageable in your classroom. Um, so you guys already know in spectrophotometers, you have to pick a wavelength, right? So um, what color was our system when it first started, before it started? Of fading. Green. green. All right, green. And then immediately it turns to what color? Blue. Blue. All right, so do you think you're going to be able to get that green solution into the spectrophotometer before it turns blue? Probably not. Okay, so we're going to be measuring something that's blue. Um, and you, we talked about first semester that when something's blue, if you see blue color coming through, that means it's absorbing a wavelength of light that's sort of opposite the color. So if you remember back, we had that um, color wheel that I gave you guys. And I said that if you're going to measure analytical wavelengths of things, um, our system is blue, right? So we're going to try to measure something that's blue, which means it absorbs the color on the other side of the color wheel. So we're looking for something in what we're at wavelength of light. About what color are we aiming for here? Orange. 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 OK, so we want to pick something that's an orange. On your spec 20, you guys actually have a, a you know, spectrum there. So what wavelengths cor sort of correspond to the orange wavelengths? Probably around 600 through 650. Okay, 600 through 650. So can we pick something in the middle there? Can we say like 635? All right, so we're going to pick the data at 635. And then you guys also know that when you use a spectrophotometer, you have to blank the instrument first, and you have to put a blank in. So um, you have to have something that's going to be similar to the solution we're working with. And what do you notice about that solution right now? Is it truly colorless? I wouldn't say so. It I'd looks clear. Yeah, it's clear. You can see through it, certainly. But does it look like there's absolutely no color, or is there sort of like a little cast in there of, of something left? Because um, bleach has color. Bleach is a little bit yellow uh, when it's in its pure form. So um, what we're actually going to do, you guys can use that as your blank. So you'll use that. You'll fill your cube out with that. Use that to zero out the instrument before you guys get started, and then you can do your trials. So every group in our, in our room is going to do one of these variations. What I need you guys to do is exactly what I did the first time. One, one drop of food coloring, 10 milliliters of bleach, 100 milliliters of water. Now, one thing I want to bring up, if we're going to start to change the amount of bleach from 10 to 20, are we keeping all variables the same if we did that? So we had, as our initial trial here, right? everyone's going to do 100 milliliters of water. Uh, everyone's going to do 10 milliliters of bleach. And everyone's going to do one drop of food coloring. right? If I suddenly take the bleach to 20 milliliters, are these systems really the same? No. no. Why not? Because it's going to change quicker. OK, so we might have a, a faster rate of reaction. But when we look at the amount of total stuff, we have 110 milliliters here, plus a drop, right? which is yeah. almost nothing. Uh, but if we go to 20 milliliters and 100 milliliters of water, are we really making the systems the same? No, because there's more amount of liquid in the All second All right, so one. now we've got 120 milliliters instead of just 100. OK, so what might we do to fix the fact that this is 110 total, but I'm going to use 20 milliliters of bleach in our second trial? Add more water. More water or less? Oh, less. 10 Cause, milliliters Right, because yeah. I want to have um, 110 milliliters total. So if I'm doing 20, then we're going to need to make that 90 milliliters of water. All right, so if you guys are going to vary concentration, that's one thing we're going to have to keep constant. We want the total solution to be the same. All right, now one thing you guys have to be very careful in, when you do that, you notice the color changes really quickly, right? Yeah. So uh, what you want to do is have everything set up, you know, measure out the bleach, measure out the food coloring and everything, pour, do a quick swirl, put it into the cuvette, and then you guys can start measuring your data right away. Okay. All right, so that's the thing you have to work really quickly when you guys get to that part. All right, but the first trial is going to be 100 milliliters with 10 milliliters of bleach. The second trial will be 90 milliliters of water and 20 milliliters of bleach. You guys ready? Yeah. Ready. All right. So let's analyze that activity that we just looked at through the lens of the 5E or 7E model. Um, in the engagement step, I demonstrated the system to my students. And so we engaged their interest by figuring out um, 
framing the system that we're going to study. And then I elicited their prior knowledge. I asked them questions to figure out what they already knew about reaction rate, what they already knew about using a spectrophotometer. So I was bringing the prior knowledge forward to get them in the frame to actually conduct the experiment. So we did sort of the engage and the elicit step together. And, and honestly, you're probably going to find those two things coming together very frequently. Um, find out what your students know and then give them something interesting to look at. So those first steps we just did in the demonstration part of the experiment. We set what the system was going to be and then we started to brainstorm a method that we could use to analyze new variables within that system. So after that we went into the exploration step and that was where we figured out what our actual procedure was going to be. Um, historically I used this experiment and I gave them a detailed list of instructions and told them that they were going to do 10 milliliters of bleach and, and 20 milliliters of bleach for their second trial and they were going to give the data. And then this year I decided to do it a little bit differently in the way that you actually saw here. I just posed the question in front of the class and had them figure out what procedures we can actually do here. So every lab group actually ends up with a slightly different procedure, which is fine because they're going to send that information to me through their email. Um, they're going to put it all into a spreadsheet, email it to me, and then I project it on the overhead projector the next day. And as a class, we start to work through conclusions. So in the exploration step, they're doing the lab for themselves. They're collecting their own data. But we're going to come together as a class the next day and start to explain what's going on in the system. Uh, and so the next day in class, I start projecting the data. I show my students how to do a linear regression. Um, in my class, uh, my school is very small, so I am the only chemistry teacher. So I already know what all of my students had in intro chemistry and before they came into advanced chemistry. So they've already had qualitative, uh, just being able to articulate concentration, catalysts, uh, temperature, the changes that influence the reaction rate on a qualitative level. But they haven't had to do numerical data processing with rate reactions yet. Um, so we're going to do that as a class, and I'm going to give them the skill set of linear regression to analyze how the slope changes for the, the graphs. And then they'll make three graphs. They'll make the regular concentration versus time, natural log of concentration versus time, and inverse of concentration versus time. But in, in lieu of concentration, I'm using absorbance here because we've already covered Beer's law, and we know that absorbance and concentration can be used uh, as substitutes for each other with spectrophotometry. Now when it comes to the evaluation part, evaluation is really heading in all parts of this lab experiment. I'm going to come to a elaboration in a second, but I do want to talk a little bit about evaluation. Um, because really, evaluation is happening through all of these steps. When I'm assessing the prior knowledge of the students, I'm seeing what do they remember from what we've already covered. When we're actually doing the lab design, I'm evaluating how well are they picking the steps together and are they giving um, steps that make sense? Are they logical? Are they sequential? And then when we get to the explanation step, I'm constantly assessing and questioning my students. But even while they're doing the lab, I'm walking around from station to station. I'm checking with groups, does your second trial make sense? Should it have gone faster? Should it have gone slower? And so evaluation's happening throughout all of this. When we get to the elaboration part, um, that's going to happen a little bit the next day when we start working through the data together. But it's also going to happen throughout the rest of the unit. Um, I do this lab pretty early on in the kinetic section of my advanced chemistry class. Um, we do this probably about the third or fourth day, and so kids know that concentration affects reaction rate, but we really haven't done a lot of the, the mathematical parts of kinetics yet. And I have them hold on to this data for the entire duration of the kinetics, lab, or kinetics unit that we do. Um, we keep referring back to this data. So kids have already generated a lot of conclusions as our discussion the next day happens. We find out that higher temperature means higher reaction rate. We find out that more concentration of bleach makes it go faster. We know lower temperature makes it go more slowly. Um, but we haven't really talked about the reasons why all of that stuff necessarily happens. And so I keep pulling back this data set with every new demonstration that I do the next couple of weeks in class. We tie it back to, and remember back that bleach lab, what happened when you changed concentration? And then we use this data when we get to things like activation energy, and we talk about why temperature can actually cause the reaction to actually go faster or slower. And then we also also get into pseudo first order rate constants at the very, very end of the unit. And this really is a pseudo first order reaction. Both bleach and the amount of food coloring do sort of have something to do with the rate of the reaction. And so the elaboration step is going to happen over the course of the week. And doing lab early on and then using that as sort of the concrete example that you can keep tying it back to your students' experience can really help them have something to ground their knowledge in to sort of build the rest of the unit forward. And then for the extension part, um, extension, as we mentioned earlier, um, 
is going to be either near transfer or distant transfer. And so a near transfer could be something like um, doing a hydrogen peroxide decomposition lab and varying the concentration of hydrogen peroxide. Um, there's lots of near transfer that are just rates of chemical reaction. But you can also start to bring things into distant transfer, bring them to newer contexts that maybe they experience in their everyday life that they might have never even thought was chemistry. Um, so for example, you could look at um, the rates of rusting and whether rusting of a car would be faster or slower under certain conditions. You could look at um, the reason why blood alcohol content rises. If kids know that the elimination of alcohol from the body is a zero order process, then they might be able to explain why consuming over a certain rate would actually cause blood alcohol to rise and that more alcohol doesn't make it go faster. Um, they could also look at methanol poisoning and the solution to methanol poisoning is actually increased ethanol content because the enzyme responsible for the degradation or the metabolism of methanol can't tell the difference between methanol and ethanol. Ethanol, the molecules are very similar. And so if you increase the ethanol concentration, when ethanol is metabolized, it actually goes into a much less harmful byproduct than when methanol is metabolized, that gets turned into formaldehyde. Now these are contexts that don't necessarily have to show up on tests or quizzes. That might be too big of a reach for your students to do, but it's really great discussion questions, really great things to talk about as in-class examples, and showing kids and demonstrating what it is like to transfer knowledge that we learn in the laboratory or that we learn in the class classroom into context that they might have experienced in everyday life. The more I think we can make connections for our students between what happens in class and what happens out of class, the more interesting they're going to find chemistry to be. But also they're going to get better at taking that knowledge that we learn in one section and being able to apply it in other parts of their everyday life. I think that's going to be a really powerful change that your students will get more out of their chemistry class when it stops being something that only happens in this room and it starts becoming something that happens everywhere.